Salvete. Tonight's live stream will focus on the Good Friday liturgy, mostly to clear up matters that might not be clear to all from previous live streams. And then if there's time after that, I don't think it will take too long, then other questions are welcome. So I noticed already we had a couple of questions asking if the SSPX say the Good Friday prayer from the pre-55, and this is the correct answer in general, that the SSPX will pray the 62 Missal. There might be exceptions here and there, but as a general warning, um, just on this channel and in this chat and the comments, please don't draw attention to any priest or parish or institute or fraternity or society by name if you know that they're doing the pre-55 or especially doing the proper old prayer for the Jews. There might be enemies looking out to get information where it is just so that they can attack. So find a way to say perhaps that it's you experienced it or you know it's happening, but without giving a location or identifying anyone. Unless, of course, they've already gone public. I mean, if it's on their website that they do that, then there's no problem. Is that um, pretty clear? We have to be careful what we say um, about identifying people who would do this because the enemies of the church want to destroy it and they will find nasty ways to do that. A couple of points from the last live streams. Um, someone asked about having a priest bless miraculous medals to, to give away and the priest said they have to come themselves to have a priest to have it conferred on them. If it's the first time you're receiving a miraculous medal and it's to wear, yes, you should go to a priest and go through the short ceremony with the proper prayers. But in general, if you're just having miraculous medals blessed, I mean, you can leave them anywhere. You can give them to people. They can carry them about. It's only they would have to go to a priest if they mean to wear it with the full intention of the devotion. And then a few mentioned about the, oh, which way I go? The Orthodox uh, Christians. Um, who bless themselves when they make the sign of the cross in the reverse way than Catholics. As the Catholics, we will go like this, and then from the left shoulder to the right. The Orthodox will do three fingers and the right shoulder to the left. I think I just went to the same shoulders then. Or the, the screen is mirrored. I'm not sure. But the point is, isn't it wonderful how the Eastern Church and the Latin Church or Western Church do it in a different way, mirrors of each other? so that everything points to the center, points to the cross, or depending which way they're facing, north or south, flows out from the cross. Um, others commented correctly that what they're doing in the Orthodox tradition is that they are mirroring what the priest himself does, whereas in the West, we copy the action of the priest in the same way. Um, it's just that thought of everything pointing to the center. Then we have some questions about receiving Holy Communion on uh, Good Friday. So it's great to hear this. Someone saying, I will refrain from receiving. Not exactly sure why. We don't need to understand everything. We just keep the traditions that have been there for hundreds and hundreds of years, trusting that there's a good reason to it, and we might discover those reasons later. The, there's one host consecrated the day before on Maundy Thursday for the Good Friday liturgy, and that's for the celebrant. Um, so it's it's not a matter of when they're consecrated. It's rather, again, just Catholic Dad asks, if the Mass of the priest sanctified is an ancient tradition, why wouldn't we receive Good Friday on Good Friday? The, the Mass of the priest sanctified has been with the Church for since time immemorial. It's, it's, it is a Mass in a sense, but it's not a Mass like other Masses. Uh, there's no canon. There's no consecration of the bread and wine and that the there will be no uh, precious blood of Christ except in that host that was consecrated on Monday Thursday and the, the one way to think about it every other day of the year is remembering Good Friday <clears throat> every mass is a memorial of the passion they point to Good Friday on Good Friday itself we connect with the passion in a slightly different way celebrating it 
<clears throat> as it was accomplished. If you are in Manchester, for example, you don't see any road signs for Manchester when you're in the town. But outside the town and across much of the country, you'll see signs pointing to where it is. So <clears throat> throughout the year, the masses point to Good Friday. But when you're there, when you're on Good Friday, you're not going to have a mass like the other days. I hope that makes sense because we're remembering the actual passion. And it's by going and kissing the cross, venerating the cross, that we express our profound love and reverence for our Savior who died for us. Um, trying to look up if there's any questions on this subject. Um, oh yeah, someone's asking about Holy Saturday and they are indeed the next couple of comments are prepared. On Holy Saturday, the liturgy is the Easter Vigil and in different places that traditionally could occur quite early, even 11 a.m. or 10 a.m. or else in the afternoon since 1955 or even 51 it's been pushed to the evening and some places will start their vigil about 10 p.m because there's many many ceremonies before you get to the mass as it were of the resurrection and which would begin after midnight the point is whenever you go to the mass on the easter saturday it's going to be the mass of the resurrection of easter sunday even if it's anticipated quite early. So it is okay to receive Holy Communion on Holy Saturday. There isn't um, a mass of Holy Saturday. It's the mass of the Easter Vigil anticipating the next day. I hope that's clear. And the three subjects to go through that we went on last week were about not receiving Holy Communion, not crying out, crucify him, and not genuflecting. So we'll go through those briefly. Um, and then see what other questions you have. Exactly, that's beautiful to hear. Um, yes, if, if somebody is ill or dying, they can receive the Holy Eucharist. When someone's dying, they can receive any time the Holy Eucharist, you want to get the priest to them. It w would be unusual, but it, it does happen that the priest will go out to them that day. Um, and there will be some hosts reserved not in the main tabernacle in the church, but the, the, a second tabernacle will be made before the Triduum so that on Holy Thursday, the host can be reserved there all the way through to Easter Sunday, specifically for the sick and the dying. Um, Karen is asking about the genuflection for the Jews. We'll come to that soon. There is a position paper by the... Um, International Federation Nuna Voce, it's position paper 28 on the Good Friday Prayer for the Jews. And at the right, at the end of that, there's an excellent section on the genuflection. I hope we'll get a link posted to that in the comments. Um, and that will explain everything, but we'll, we'll go through that question presently after talking about crying out, crucify him. Um, you know, this is a novice order thing. It doesn't happen in the traditional mass because we have another oh by the way happy birthday doctor obvious if if you're i think you are listening you just gave a comment um so doctor obvious says there i think you mean you've heard two cantors crying or singing chanting these words crucify him during the reading of the passion on good friday or indeed on um, Palm Sunday, it would be the gospel or the passion from St. Matthew's gospel will be chanted or recited. Then on Spy Tuesday, the passion from the gospel of St. Mark on, um, did I say Spy Tuesday? Did I mean Spy, on, on Holy Tuesday? And then Spy Wednesday, it's the passion from the gospel of St. Luke. And on Good Friday, the passion from the gospel of St. John. So you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of them the accounts of the Passion on Palm Sunday, the Tuesday, the Wednesday, and the Friday. And when those words crucify him come, either it's the celebrant reading the Passion or it's three deacons in the traditional Mass as well, could be chanting it and one of them will have those lines. Or it's permitted that you have a choir who could sing those words of the, the mob in polyphony. And maybe that's what you were referring to there, Dr. Obvious. Um, 
And Sylvester Kay is right about the four um, accounts of the Passion being sung on four days through Holy Week. So, but when in the Novus Ordo, they expect the people, the faithful, to cry this out. And it does turn your stomach. You should feel a reluctance to do it. And I hope at some point, if you have to be at a Novus Ordo, just don't say those words. Um, the, there is the, on Spy Wednesday, there's the liturgy of Holy Week, the mass of that day in Holy Week with the passion from the Gospel of St. Luke. Um, but it's, I hope everyone's got a, or it's great to have a hand missile. The St. Andrew's missile or the Father Lassant's missile, hand missile, seem to be the best options out there. Feel free to chip in with suggestions if you have um, other good pre-55 versions and studying those. Or you can now, there's different places publishing a book just for Holy Week with all the ceremonies of Holy Week, including Tenebrae. Um, it's, it's worth looking those up online. If it, again, if anyone wants to post a link, I have some. Maybe I'll show them next week I'll, if I remember to do that. Um, so are we clear on not shouting crucify him? That's just a Novus Ordo thing. It's never, you're never going to be expected to do that at a traditional Triduum. So best to get to the traditional one. Um, Yes, this it's a massive deal changing the Holy Week. And I have got a link in the description of this video to a podcast about the Good Friday Prayer for the Jews. And that's a chapter from the book, If You Believe Moses, Volume 2. And it will go into the Jewish lobbying on the church. And they even had priests infiltrated in false converts to bring this about that once the church changed her liturgy for Holy Week, then everything became possible. The destruction that we've seen ever since started with that. So we'll get to the genuflection, just one point here. Um, I misunderstood this comment last week, I think, but you're quite right that if on Good Friday you're standing during the prayer for the Jews and someone tries to trouble you and say, hey, you should be genuflecting, I mean, it's best not to address them during the liturgy. Just ignore them, or if they're being a pest. I mean, it's only for two seconds anyway, so they don't have much chance. If they're being a pest, say to them, talk to me after the liturgy. Don't talk to me in church. Um, but the fact that there are conferences of bishops who expect people to stand up during the canon and during the consecration, then how can they object to anybody standing at any other time in the church's year? So I hope that's cleared up those three points. If you have any questions on them, do feel free to put them in the chat and I'll spot them. Meanwhile, this is all for this strategy. I'm trying to get this idea out through the books that the Old Testament is completely fulfilled in Jesus Christ in the New Covenant and that the one of the biggest threats to the church is her taking on the ideas of Judaism. This was always a threat to the church from the beginning. And the apostles were very robust in seeing it off, in maintaining a pure Christianity. The Jews, a lot of them are searching very hard for a Messiah and for the fulfillment of the old. They can be very passionate about it and very erudite, very convincing. And if Catholics aren't grounded in tradition, then they're vulnerable to taking this on. And when we do, we, we, we lose Christ, and then we're looking for a false messiah and an earthly political kingdom. So that's what the book series is trying to show, and that God has foreseen everything in advance. So much is told already in the Old Testament about the Passion of Christ, about the Virgin Mary's victory, about the Mass, and about the conversion of the Jews at the end, which is why we're praying this so sincerely on Good Friday, to, to see God's victory, that everything comes together in the end. So stage two of the strategy, which we're at now, is about talking about this intersection, not genuflecting or not crying out, crucify him. I hope that's explained. And stage three, which could begin this year, already happened a bit last year, but hopefully next year will everyone who's on, on board with this is to persuade priests and bishops 
that we need to recover the pre-55. And in due course, when there's a Catholic Pope who loves the church and loves Christ, maybe a few bishops and cardinals can speak to him. Doesn't take many and convince him to remove all restrictions from the pre-55 liturgy because they have no basis in law. It's illegal to try to stop it. The Missal of 1570 with Crow Primum stands for all time and nobody can forbid it. It's another matter if they want to introduce another liturgy like the Novus Ordo. Now, I think it's uh, illegitimate, but th that doesn't need to be debated so much as the fact that no one can forbid the pre-55. They're two different matters. And if God, if God is pleased by these efforts, um, we will get our traditions back. So I will go through the questions now, which I've spotted. Um, oh, we don't want to obscure the lamb. Oh, we just we just saw that one, didn't we? Yeah. Um, I hope the answer was okay. Um, yes, it is it, very disturbing. The writings of the divine will. Um, I'll do a third video, God willing, this week to try and show where it's come from. And the, the point of the videos is to show that the, the source of it all, the writings, they are repugnant and they're full of error. So all the other arguments people bring around it, if they don't deal with that, then the point is this isn't something to be promoted. That's no condemnation of Louisa. Um, it's to simply say this isn't to be promoted. And um, you know when there's a cause for canonization of someone, they will examine the person's life to see that there's heroic virtue. They will examine their writings to see that there's no error. They appoint a devil's advocate to look for possible negative consequences of a canonization or where it won't stand. And they require two or three miracles. When the church is making all that effort to get it right, then of course God will assist with the Holy Spirit. And so we could always trust canonizations before that process was changed uh, two or three decades ago, I think. And so it was to the point people thought a canonization is infallible, and it was pretty much infallible. But since the process was changed and the church isn't taking care to make sure these people are truly saints, instead we see with the canonization so-called of Paul VI, it's a political thing. And in that case, well, why should the Holy Spirit give his assistance that the church is right on this? And then it's a mistake we make if we think every canonization is infallible. In any case, the point is someone can be in heaven, doesn't mean you canonize them because they're not an example for everyone. And whether or not Louisa had a life of sanctity, the point is her writings are full of error and we don't want to present those writings to the faithful, and therefore it's a bad idea to beatify or canonize her, and please God, that will never happen. I hope all that's clear. Um, no, on Good Friday, right at the beginning, there's an uh, oratio where everyone will kneel. That's before even the um, chanting of the Passion. Then after the Passion, there are the nine great intercessions, and you genuflect in the middle of each one except the eighth one, which is the prayer for the Jews, because we don't want to associate ourselves with the mockery of Christ there. And then later, after the great intercessions, there will be the veneration of the cross, and everyone will go up and genuflect before they kneel and kiss the cross, and then stand, genuflect again, and, and leave. So there are plenty of other genuflections on Good Friday. There is on the Easter Vigil, the 12 prophecies, and in the last of those, there's no genuflection after the last one because it's about Nebuchadnezzar insisting people bow down to his idol, his golden statue, and there we don't want to associate ourselves with idolatry as the three young men didn't bow down to it and God preserved them, so we don't bow down for idolatry on the vigil and we don't bow down for the mockery of Christ on Good Friday. Um, I hope that's clear. Um, do we have the link to the position paper 28 posted in the chat, the FIUV position paper on the Good Friday Prayer for the Jews? It, it takes a bit of uh, time to read it, but it's the most thorough thing out there, I think. And 
it has this section on the genuflection right at the end. But if you do a search for genuflection, then you can see all the references to it. Um, I, you can go to the SSPX. They're reliable. And I don't think I'll devote a whole live stream to it because it's... I used to be opposed to the SSPX. I used to be. I was wrong. I apologize for that. Um, I think... Imagine 700 years ago, if you walk into a church, um, the, for me, the model Catholic is the medieval peasant. And if he walks into a church, he doesn't need to know, um, and he can't carry out <coughs> research <clears throat> on who ordained that priest and what are the constitutions of the institution that the priest is with or the diocese or whatever. If it looks like the mass and it smells like the mass and it sounds like the mass, if there's no irreverence there to put you off, if the homily is sound and you're not hearing anything wrong in the homily, then you're fine there. It's good. <clears throat> Only later, it's the duty of the bishops and the hierarchy to sort out questions of schism and heresy and all that where that might apply or where priests are suspended and put out the information. But walking in there, you're not obliged to know all that. And now we have the internet and everyone feels under pressure to know everything and make a judgment on everything. We, we can't. The more you find out about this subject, the, the more you kind of keep silent. It's just nowhere near as simple as people say. And the SSPX are upholding tradition. They have a very beautiful, worthy liturgy. I pray one day that as a body, they would move to the pre-55, but that's probably going to depend upon changes in from Rome. Um, might happen here and there otherwise but don't have any problems about going to sspx only if you find something's wrong there then th that would be something to consider if it's a very local problem um, but that's that's going to be true everywhere um valid yes um i i think it's um a shame though that they don't just do the pre-55 missile, why not? Um, I find it strange to have any attachment to anything to do with Anglicanism or Thomas Cranmer. There's certain th things they're very good at in a worldly way. I mean, um, if you listen to Gavin Ashton, he's an excellent at communicating and he's very gentle. Um, and I think that's part of his Anglican background and training because the Anglicans really don't want to offend and he's very courageous and he'll spell out hard truths and so he's very effective and this is certainly an advantage that he's he's carried from the anglican background because as well the anglicans stole pretty much everything 500 years ago and they dominated so they don't feel under pressure as some catholics maybe feel a bit resentful that they're a tiny minority in this country that belongs to our lady england um and they had to be more combative and a bit more um, sure of their, their group to stay alive. So, but having said that, because of the Anglican attacks on the Holy Mass, Thomas Cranmer saying it's pretty much diabolical, I think, in the 39 articles or what, 40 articles, whatever. I don't see, and, and the fact that the Anglicans put priests to death for saying Mass and put so many Catholics in prison for their fidelity to God. I think when you've had a conversion to the true church, aren't you disgusted with all that? Doesn't it make you angry, all that Anglicanism? Don't you want to be completely shut of it and have no carryover whatsoever um, as, as you become a Catholic? It might take time to make that transition. But anyway, God bless the ordinary. They're definitely on the, I think, the, the side of the angels. Um, so... No worries about that question on the SSPX. Um, yeah, as, yeah, third video coming to, to wrap that all up about the divine will. Um, if you look in your 56 St. Joseph Missal and compare it... Um, with the pre-55 rights online, I think it is probably going, that's probably going to incorporate the changes for Holy Week. The 56 missile will have the changed Holy Week, probably. Um, so it's better to get a pre-55.
But that would serve you in many traditional parishes where they say the 62. You'll have the text there. Um, but it's still, I think, it's, if, it might be a bit difficult to follow if you have the pre-55 texts in front of you. But they're saying a 62 mass. It would get a bit confusing. Um, it, but that's something we, I think we build up over time. That we have, I have some links to the new liturgical movement. They have some very in-depth articles on the changes for Good Friday. I don't think that everybody is going to be um, keen to, to read through them because they're very detailed about the rubrics. But they give you Id an idea of the pointless changes made, especially to the Good Friday liturgy, just to destroy its connections with the Mass. Um, even though there's, there's no canon, the, lot, the vestments were black and uh, appropriate for Mass, whereas in the changed version, that you have violet vestments on Good Friday, when we should be thinking of the death of our Lord, and black is most appropriate. They don't have maniples, which is a sign that you're not at Mass, um, which was a, a pointless change. There's many using copes, for example, or tunicles instead of the folded um, vestments for the deacon and subdeacon, all sorts of little changes which were pointless, like instead of the priest, deacon, and subdeacon being in a line one behind the other, they have them standing next to each other as, the, as they might join the creed, for example, or the gloria, but they have them doing that during the great intercessions or the um, parts of the mass of the pre-sanctified, and it's just to disrupt so that we break that connection with the mass. But basically, the 56 missile will be good for most of the year, but it will include the changed Holy Week, which is not ideal. But of course, it's far more um, reverent and rich in prayers than the Novus Ordo. Um, That's a shame, yes, Holy Eucharist. Um, Eucharist means Thanksgiving. When we say Holy Eucharist, we're making it clear we mean the sacrament. Um, I dodged one question out of cowardice, this one. Who believes in malarianism? I, I, loads of crackpots. A bunch of Protestants believe in it, that there's going to be this new age, this thousand-year reign, for example, of uh, the of Christ on earth, uh, and it's, it's garbage. Um, there is a verse, I think, in Apocalypse, which talks about this thousand-year reign, but it's very much to be interpreted symbolically as a time of completeness. It could coincide with the triumph of Our Lady's Immaculate Heart. But there's still, there's going to be poverty on earth. There's going to be sin. We'll have original sin. We'll never reach this stage where there's a new and better way of receiving grace than the sacraments. Um, so there's many variations of millenarism or millenarism, is it called? Um, like dispensationalism, where you're looking for a new dispensation, as if they say God brought in various dispensations through history with Noah, then Abraham, Moses, David, then with Jesus Christ, and they're waiting for another one after Jesus, as if his work is incomplete, as if there's something better still to come here on earth. There isn't. Um, th I went through quite a lot of this in the last video on the divine will about the five errors. I think the uh, second or third error I dealt with was about this coming of a new era. It's a Jewish idea of the Messiah inaugurating a political kingdom on earth. And I think it will be, I mean, it's absurd some of the um, expectations people have of it as if they were going to restore the Garden of Eden and go to a time, back to a time of paradise. As you know, without well, Jews don't believe in original sin. Judaism rejects that idea, but that will that will always be with us. It's the all the sin is washed out in baptism, but the effects of it remain. That we have a clouded intellect, a weakened will, we're subject to sickness and death. That will always be on earth. So th these promises of a new millennium are heretical. Uh, and I hope that answers your question. Tell me if not, or if anyone has a better answer, do chip in. Catholics fall for it as well, because the shepherds aren't protecting us. You know, King David was chosen by God to be king of Israel, 
I forget which psalm it says, it's because it said he used to go after the sheep and look after the sheep and go after the pregnant sheep to help, help them deliver. And it said with the intellect in his hands, it's talking about having an understanding, as it were. In, he didn't literally have an intellect in his hands, but he had this um, very practical craft to look after the sheep. And that meant fighting off wolves and bears and lions to protect the flocks. This is what the bishops should be doing as good shepherds. The wolves stand for the rapacious, who just want your money. The bears stand for sexual perversion, I'd say, perhaps homosexuality. And the lions stand for those who want to usurp the throne, or even Satanists who want to uh, replace Catholicism with their religion. And it's not only David was a shepherd, Moses was a shepherd. He spent 40 years in Midian being a shepherd. Abraham was a shepherd with enormous flocks, you know, very skilled with a whole bunch of herdsmen under him. Abel was a shepherd, the first, and he's the first man to die. So we have all these shepherds who are key in God's plan to point to Jesus Christ, who's the good shepherd. And now the bishops who are successors of the apostles, who are meant to be shepherds, they should be fighting off the wolves and the bears and the lions. That is the rapacious and avaricious, the sexually perverted, and the false religions. Um, but they're not doing it very attentively or courageously, and therefore lots of Catholics are falling into this belief that there's going to be an, another age, a new age, a new dispensation, or a thousand-year kingdom of peace, as it were. Um, it's all an error. We, we will have to struggle to the end, work out our salvation in fear and trembling until the end. So coming down the list of questions. Um, yeah, Bugnini was very much involved with the changes to the Holy Week and very, very likely he was a Freemason, certainly involved with them, very likely that he was. What a disaster. Doesn't that just prove as much as we need to know? The Freemasons who, who hate the church, um, who want to replace her, and they had a hand in designing the new Holy Week. That's why we have to go back to the pre-55. And we can't wait for the hierarchy. We can do our part now. It's not disobedience because no one has any right to take this away. And if all we can do is not go for Holy Communion on Good Friday and not genuflect for the Jews and not quite crucify them at the Novus Ordo, that is already the faithful showing we want the pre-55. And the good priests and the good bishops will listen to that. They'll take it on board. And in God's time, it will come back. Um, so here's, is that a recommendation for the, it looks like the divine office rather than the other liturgies. Um, maybe you're answering someone's question there. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it, it has to be a cleric, really, for the Passion. But then again, there's so many changes in the Novus Ordo. Having Eucharistic ministers is uh, an abomination. Um, so having someone read out the Passion, or they have in loads of Novus Ordo Masses, right? Someone comes up to read the, the reading. Um, I don't know, do they read the Gospel there as well? It's it's wrong. That's great. Having a, a 55 missile, that should be good. Um, the, the, the reading and the gospel, the epistle and the gospel are also a sacrifice offered to God, which is why they're always done at the altar in Latin, because they're offered to God for the living and the dead. So they're not, in our language, English or Latin or, or English, German or French or whatever, or Spanish, um, because it's, it's offered for all these souls, first to God. Then after, say, the priest has read the gospel at the altar, then you have the deacon chant it. This is in the pre-55. That changed also in Holy Week, where they ceased what they called doubling, that the priest would read something at the altar, and then the deacon or sometimes subdeacon would chant it for everybody to hear. Um, but always in Latin, and it shows it's part of the sacrifice offered to God. The Mass is one. We shouldn't be dividing it too much. As There is a mass of catechumens at the beginning, and then they would leave, and then you'd have the mass of the faithful, which includes Holy Communion, and the mass of the catechumens was more the proclaiming of the word. 
But we shouldn't divide the mass as if it's two sections, that like one for us and then one, one for God. It's all for God and it's all to be done in Latin. Um, happy birthday again. I see there's, there's loads of questions, so I think I will, co or comments, I'll come down quite fast. Um, I don't know what Aviso is. Uh, is the Aviso some new new age? If it is, it's it's a lie. Um, yeah, I, I saw this. Is it in Carpi or Carvi, uh, north of Bologna, in a museum church there? They have the most disgusting paintings ever painted, I think, on exhibition. And when the faithful complained, the diocese blamed them, said there's something wrong with their sensitivities to art. And that this is the way of groomers. And I think we saw that a bit with the divine will thing. You say the divine will writings are repugnant because there's so much in that's repugnant. And then these people, defenders of it, start calling you a pervert because you find the, the writings inappropriate and repugnant. And they start to attack you for that. And so it is with these horrific paintings, blasphemous, being exhibited in a church museum now. And um, when people complain, the diocese turns the pressure on them. It, it's so uh, wicked how far the enemy has penetrated into the hierarchy. Um, and that's how crazy devotions get some measure of approval before they're shut down, because there's this corruption up there. Um, I don't know the St. Benedict prayer book, but if you're into the Lassance Missal and have that recommendation, the Lassance is excellent. I, I hope the St. Benedict prayer book is too. Um, okay. Yes, there's, often when a, a process is underway, then people ca can get permission to study those writings, but there's not permission to promote them publicly. Um, I'd, I'd, certainly now, since her course is disbanded, I don't see how her writings should be promoted publicly, but I don't know if they ever got permission to have that after they were put on the index in 1938, some of them at least. But when, when a whole bunch of someone's books three titles, I think, but involved various volumes of her books were put on the index in 1938. That's the signal to everyone, there's a problem here. Be, you know, tread carefully, steer, steer clear. Um, and those problems have, have not gone away. Um, Yes, because the, the Catholic religion is true, then it can't be beaten by any kind of rational argument or debate. Um, but the enemy likes to copy and corrupt and distract. Uh, um, they'll do whatever they can to distract, including you getting you spending hours reading materials that just take you away from reading the Bible and the saints. Um, Amen. I agree. Yeah, this is a point. If a priest gives you a penance, you can ask the priest for another penance. Normally, it's be best if it ramps up the labor of that penance in a sense. So you can't, shouldn't really ask for an easy one unless he's dumped something outrageous on you. Um, but if you don't, if you have an aversion to certain prayers for whatever reason, then you can ask for another one and the priest should give another penance. Um, I have to think about this. No, not necessarily, in that as long as you're not... Um, 
sinning if the if the marriage is valid and then you can you can go to the sacraments if you're the catholic spouse um if th there wasn't permission to have a mixed faith marriage and it's invalid then yes do wait to have this sanatio and radice which makes the marriage valid um but if you're to go to confession and you tell your situation and you receive absolution then you can go to the sacraments unless you're living then in sin um if for some reason it's not a true marriage and you're, you're sharing a bed um, then best not to go to the sacraments but you want that process of sanation to happen quickly better to check though with a tribunal or your priest not just to me on a live chat i might have got something wrong there basically if you've been to confession and received absolution um and you're not living in uh, and giving scandal then you can receive the sacraments um yeah it's it's um the sspx also the fraternity and the institute and other priests they're very good with confessions um before and after mass and such a reg regularity more and more dioceses, you have to make an appointment for confession, which people are very uncomfortable doing. A lot of people want to be anonymous, understandably, just to turn up, go in and out of confession, and you don't have to uh, telephone anyone or go up to a desk and ask for an appointment. And when that happens, it's an appointment. Normally, you're going to come face to face with the priest before or after, which isn't ideal at all. So. And if you if they cease having regular confessions on the schedule, a few times a week, then th it just begins to die out everywhere because it becomes too inconvenient. Um, and it's a priest in a confessional. It's not wasted time if no one comes for confession. He can always pray the rosary there, or, or it's not ideal for praying the office because you might get interrupted. But he can use use that time for meditation, have a bit of peace. Uh, which you won't have an abundant amount of for in most parishes. Um, so it's, it's good just to have that regular thing before every Mass there's going to be time for confession. So can anyone check that on the Good Friday Prayer for the Jews? Um, the podcast link, is it working? I won't be able to check it just yet. Um, but if... If anyone else can check it, we'll see if it works. And if, if it's broken, I'll try and fix it afterwards. So, Thaddeus, yeah, I'm sorry that you take it this way. Um, what I'm saying about Louisa is that I hope she's in heaven. I think she was a victim. I think she was manipulated, not necessarily by clerics or family or any human agent. That would explain a lot if they were there, but certainly by darker forces below. And I'll Try to demonstrate that in the third video. The first one was to show this whole divine will thing is very problematic, which Thaddeus, I'm sure you can see lots of people agree with. They're disgusted by this. And it's nothing to do with us trying to hold a traditionalist line. It's just if you have a sense of the faith and you love the faith and you love the reverence that's given to God, if you have a proper distance and a proper reverence, then you can have a true intimacy. If you have an inappropriate familiarity with God, then you cannot get a proper spiritual union or intimacy. That's what people are trying to preserve when they have an aversion to these repugnant passages in the divine will writings. And then when you analyze the whole, there's so many theological errors, massive, colossal errors, which I showed in the last video, that I want to protect people from that. I wasn't going to do any of these divine will videos over the last... Two years, people have been asking me, Father, what's this about the divine will? And I would tell them quietly, I, d I don't trust it. Um, and then some people were trying to promote it to me and promote it on the channel, getting very aggressive and pushing it very hard and even calling me a, of the devil because I didn't want to promote the divine will. But I, when I looked into it and see that this is a lot to do with false messianism, and it has roots in Kabbalah and Zohar, then it perfectly fits with the aims of this channel, which is very much about praying properly for the conversion of the Jews, for understanding how they were chosen by God to welcome the Messiah. And when he came, then 
his word goes to the ends of the earth and the sacraments, his presence there, and the Jews will convert at the end. And this divine will devotion is part of the rejection of Christ. And th there's so much in it that's Kabbalistic and from the Talmud that it, then I thought, aha, uh -huh, well, it fits perfectly with the aims of this channel, so I'll do three videos on it, not only to get these people off my back who are aggressively pushing it and hassling other people in the comm box, but also to protect people from it because it's tragic. I've, also, I've met people, people I like, people Catholics around here who ask me about it, who have all the books, and their father is this good or not. That's what provoked me to address it. It's nothing against Louisa, poor woman, Poor woman in all sorts of regards. She's a victim. And you know what? Those, those, that force, those persons who are victimizing her, I hate them. I want them destroyed. Thaddeus, that's why I'm doing this. So you, you've messaged me 50 times about this. Wait till you've seen the third video. And I hope you see that there's a, there's a good reason, very good reason for bringing this up. And I'm far from alone in doing so. Anyway, thank you for any of your prayers, Thaddeus, that are sincere, and believe me, you have mine. Um, and God willing, we can put this divine will thing to bed. Yep. Yep. It's, it's, a lot, it's how a lot of us Catholics feel about having grown up in the Novus Ordo. We feel we've been robbed by our own shepherds. They stole from us. They lied to us. Um, it, it's, and coming back to tradition, it's like discovering your home and, and that you were kidnapped as a kid without realizing it. I mean, imagine if you're kidnapped as a one-year-old. You wouldn't be aware. And then later in your life, you find out your true family. That's what it's like to come back to tradition. Um Yes, you'll get solid homilies at the SSPX. Um, the first major changes to the traditional liturgy, or really the first negative changes, uh, some people will talk about those of the divine office under Pius X. That's a big subject. Um, I wouldn't voice an opinion on that. But it was 1951 under Pius XII, they changed their Easter Vigil ceremonies. And that was to be on a four-year experiment. Um, and then in 1955, they changed the whole of Holy Week and the Vigil of Pentecost. Um, and then in 1962, introduced a new missile where you had not only these changes for Holy Week, but then a lot of other disruptions to the calendar and the, the rubrics. Um, so it was the Easter Vigil that was the first to be assaulted, but it, it was optional from 1951 to 55, whether or not you said that. Um, although I, I, best if everyone just rejected it, and that didn't happen sadly. And in 55, they wanted to enforce this new Holy Week. So it actually started in 1956, because after Easter in 1955 that they promulgated the, the missile with this changed Holy Week. So I, you could say the pre-56 People say pre-55, it gets complicated if you're trying to say the pre-51, but that in 1951 was just the Easter Vigil and it was just, it was optional. Um, okay, I, I didn't, I still don't know what a viso is. Um, I, I don't trust Garabandal just because I don't believe children walking backwards up a mountain um, is from God. He doesn't do anything against nature. He, he, he can speed up the processes of nature. He can go above it. He doesn't go against it. And those videos of the host suddenly appearing on the tongue of one of the children, it just looks like they've cut the video. They just got this technology of how to splice a video. And they thought, oh, we can, we can do this. And it's all, it's these 16 warnings. It's so melodramatic. I know there's a very, very good bishop who, who believes in Garbandal. I have lots of respect for him, but personally, I, we have Fatima, we have Lourdes, we have Guadalupe, we have Walsingham. Um, so I don't see anything great coming out of Garbandal or even good. I don't, I, I'm, it stinks. 
Um, so, so that's strange. I'm curious if anyone knows um, if on a live chat, and sometimes if I'm watching a live stream, I can set it back, you know, 15 minutes and put it on double speed to catch up if I want to, if I miss the beginning. And on some, it seems you can't do that. You just have to watch from where they're at. If anyone knows what I'm talking about, if you could let me know in the chat here, if this is a live stream where you're able to go back five or 10 or 20 minutes and then watch it from earlier and watch it at a higher speed, perhaps, or if you're fixed and stuck on the, the present moment. But sorry about that, Skunky X. I don't know why that's happening. And there was a question before if the link is working to the podcast about the Good Friday Prayer for the Jews. It's, it's one of the first links in the description of this video. If anyone could just go and check it, um, it's the one with podcast in it, and see if it opens up for you. If not, I'll try and fix it for the next one. Um, yes, lots of factions. I mean, there's a beauty in diversity. If you look in, in nature, all the species there are, in, in a forest or in a coral reef, you have this great diversity and it, it works together as a harmony. But sometimes we human beings, especially you get territorial about your neighbors. You're not bothered about the people that live five streets away so much. Uh, you're in peace with them because they're out of sight. But it's your immediate neighbors people can get very defensive about. I, I noticed this driving through Bulgaria, I think, and looking at the architecture of the churches. And in a way, they have those onion domes. So I might, it might have been Hungary. I think it was Bulgaria, though. And they were a historical board with Islam. And so although there was some architectural uh, confluence, similarity with the East or Islam, there were so many signs of Christianity, so many public crucifixes. And they really knew they are on the border with Islam, they are going to demonstrate the faith everywhere, make a public profession of it <clears throat> to keep that Christian identity. And uh, maybe the Muslims stressed it on their side of the border and were a bit weaker further in. When you're near the heartlands, you don't feel the threat. And when you're not under pressure, sometimes you don't rise to the occasion. And I think this can happen between traditional groups, that there are differences between the Institute of Christ the King, Fraternity of St. Peter, SSPX, or Bon Pasteur, there are differences, and sometimes they can get fixated on those differences to protect their own identity. Um, it's just a shame when it descends yeah, to, to infighting. Um, but we all have to watch out for that all the time, right? And the other extreme is people who just don't care, don't care about anything. That's not great, great either. Uh, so we can be proud of our traditions and cling on to our charisma or constitutions. Um, that sounds a bit odd from a, a priest who, who left, for, for I think I have good reason to do so. Um, like you have patriotism, you love your country, but it doesn't mean you hate other countries, right? That's patriotism is a good value, a necessary value. It's a virtue. Um, and so we, we hope to love what we have without despising those who have different ways of doing it as long as it's fully Catholic. Um, yeah, it, it's an experience when you start learning the faith, you just realize how little you know, and um, it might never stop because it's like I th think perhaps seeing God in heaven, you, you're never going to get to the bottom of Him. You just you, you know more and more. Um, and but w once you kind of realize that and get comfortable with our own littleness and with your own duties of state. What are your duties of state? What do you need to know? And if you have children, you, well, you really do need to know because you should be passing it on to them. And often it's the questions of the children can make the parents realize how little they know and that perhaps they better get back to the books. Um, but it, And it's never too late to pick it up. You know, St. Augustine wrote about God can leave certain people in um, the darkness or sin for a long time, much of their life, because when they convert, it brings a real eagerness to serve him for all their life that remains. And if that seems to be short, then you have this great intensity of wanting to be completely his. And God knows why he brings people in at a certain point of their life. It might be he brings them in early to keep them out of trouble, or he might bring them in late 
because he knew they wouldn't have kept it if they'd brought them in earlier. They might have fallen away. Basically, but God's timing is perfect, and it's just wonderful to have made that conversion whenever it is. Um, So here we have something on, I think, Millerianism. Um, yeah, we definitely expect many trials and tribulations till Jesus comes again. The marvelous thought that he is coming. He's definitely coming. And every hour that passes we, brings us closer, closer to that. Whether it's in our lifetime or not, it might be hundreds of years away. Um, but he's coming and he's here. He's here. He lives in your soul. Yeah, amazing that we fell for that. Um, this this common line, I'm not really catching up toward the bottom. Um, at least I can go through. All ah, right, so here's a viso. So is that a final warning to the bull before you kill it? Uh, and some people think there's going to be a final warning to mankind. All this stuff, by the way, about the warning is garbage or enlightening of conscience. No, no, no. We have now to repent. We have lent to examine our consciences and do penance. Um, there's not going to be some great warning, although the trials will increase, the persecution will increase, and that should be warning enough to wake people up. You know, the COVID period woke a lot of people up that there's some freaks with a lot of power in the world. But as a, a special miracle, some great warning, no, no, we, we have now. You see, if there were, if it were true that at some point there's going to be this miraculous enlightening of consciences, then a whole lot of people are going to sit back and wait for that. And they're going to carry on in sin and think, well, I'll get this wake-up call when it's needed. And God doesn't want that. He specifically didn't tell us when the last day would be. He, and he said, will I find faith on earth? The fact that we don't know is what keeps us on our toes, keeps us alert and alive in the spiritual life. Because if he had said, yes, there will be faith on earth, we might get complacent and we might not fight for tradition as much as we have to. If he had said there will not be faith on earth, then some people would get despondent and think, what's the point? of trying to maintain the faith and tradition if it's all going to die out. So he left us in the dark on that result, and that's actually the best for salvation. So this aviso, yep, I don't think there'll be a final warning, but thank you for explaining what that means. Yeah, this illumination of conscience. No, 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 don't believe it, please. Like anybody tells you this, it's wrong. It's wrong. There's no warrant for it in the scriptures or in the church fathers or in the councils of the church, or the scholastics, or the saints. Um, and if there is someone who's called a saint who's talking about this, be very, very suspicious. We've just had decades of the church promoting perverts to the highest levels in the church. We're seeing these disgusting exhibitions in cathedrals and churches, like the one we mentioned earlier in Capri or Carvi in Italy. Also in the Stephansdom in Vienna now, they have this massive purple shroud with our Lord shown upside down, which is satanic. When such people are in the hierarchy, then why are we supposed to think that every canonization is infallible and everyone who is supposed to be a saint, that all their decisions and e expressions were good? That was, that's never true of a saint. Even saints can make mistakes. Um, so, so if there's some, I don't know who says there's this illumination of conscience coming, but if they tie it in with some saint, then they're either lying or they've made that up or else there's something dodgy going on with that canonization process. You know, there's so much bribery and corruption in the church, um, and the Masons have had such an influence destroying the liturgy. I'm sure they could get a couple of people canonized if they had to, if, if they realized that by doing so they could promote error. Well, Paul VI has been canonized. Um, so I'm going to skip down fairly fast um, as we've been going an hour, and maybe it's... Is that a hand missile for the faithful? Um, you know, Benedictines in the 1940s, probably very reliable, very good. Um, I'm dodging some other questions. 
should I, or should I answer? You know, I've kept my opinion to myself on this. Um, why should I, I say what I think when I'm unsure? Um, my, when my mother died just over 10 years ago, I was praying this for her and I accepted it and believed it. Um, since then, I've heard people say that it's removing emphasis from God's justice onto mercy. And you might not think that's a problem until we see how the concept of mercy is being so wrongly represented under Francis. It makes you a little bit suspicious. Then also to see that extract in her diary from, was it 1936, where God or Jesus apparently said to her, um, I will have a greater intimacy with you than with all other creatures. And that, again, is, is, sounds very wrong. I can't think of any saint who writes like that or speaks like that or who would say Jesus said that. And then I saw an explanation recently about when never has the church had feasts for the attributes of God. You can have feasts for events in the life of Jesus Christ, you know, his nativity at Christmas, his resurrection at Easter, his transfiguration are great feasts and we're celebrating these events in the life of Christ. You can have feasts for, the, in this way, the divine persons. He's the Son of God. For Pentecost, it's for, very much for the Holy Spirit. Interestingly, although you, there is the feast of the Blessed Trinity, all three persons, there's no feast for the Father himself, for God the Father. And that's because everything is for the Father, everything. So it would be out of place to have a single feast for him. But there were never feasts, and the Holy Office prohibited devotions to attributes of God, meaning divine mercy or divine will, because part of the fear was this will confuse the faithful by dividing God up as if there's many gods. And if someone say, oh, I prefer the divine mercy to the divine will, or to the, this to the divine justice, or this to the omnipotence, that's crazy because God's substance is one and all these things are identical with God. Um, and so we don't want to separate them through the church year and we don't want to have people rating them as if they're, they're in any, um, one is better than the other. So since I used to in the past kind of accept the divine mercy thing and one thing still that I think speaks for it strongly is that John Paul II died on what he had made Divine Mercy Sunday. I think, how long was it after he instituted that feast? Like more than 15 years after. And I just don't, don't think any conspiracists could have organized that he would die on the very day of that feast that he'd made so much of. So that, to me, speaks of its authenticity. But my mind isn't made up. I don't know. And because I'm averse to that thing from the diary, um, and I, I don't like this total uh, emphasis on mercy without a consideration for his justice. Although I'm sure lots of devotees of divine mercy believe and love God's justice too, fine. But I leave it well alone. And it's not in the traditional calendar. We have low Sunday, Dominica in Albis, one week after Easter Sunday. So we, we don't, we're not required to have anything to this devotion. It's a private thing, um, just I'm happy to leave people alone on that. Um, and I've, until now, I've, I've not voiced my opinion in public because, um, like the lady said before, we're always learning all the time and you're learning that how, how little we know. Um, I'm, I'm definitely not catching up with the bottom of the list. Um, So what I might do, although this looks very appropriate to the conversation, I might wrap up and then I'll look through the other comments later and save them for next week. Um, I hope I've explained enough about this general strategy and especially what we do on Good Friday. And after Easter, I'll, I'll think how, you know, there'll be a bit of a pause from that because we have a year till the next Easter. Have a think about how to raise the profile of the ideas with sympathetic priests and perhaps sympathetic bishops. And they might be slow to take it on board. They might not give it public approval, but it'd be great if it's in their minds so that if a good pope is elected, that they're going to need to be on the ball 
to present it to him. Um, that's an interesting point. Um, All right, I, th I think it, it gets a bit painful if people are re-watching the live stream and I'm just staring here, reading the questions, trying to find ones that are on subject. So, last one here. Oh, um, I, in the third video, which I hope will come out this week, I will be showing parts of the diaries that speak about the passion and th they talk about Our Lady um, pushing the crown of thorns onto Louisa, it's Louisa being crucified, and Jesus and Mary saying what joy and contentment it gives them to crucify her. It's, um, this isn't mysticism. This is to do with sadistic abuse, to groom someone into feeling that someone can do anything to them, and however rotten it makes them feel, and however painful the experience is for them, they're told you're saving the world by accepting this, by putting up this. You're doing something good and holy by putting up with this. Um, so w w whether I've had heard other people say this, that Our Lady apparently cried out, crucify him, which is absolute blasphemy. It's, it's horrible. I, I don't know if that's in the writings or the diaries or anything. I'll, I'll look it up. Um, but how that could come into anyone's mind, or how anyone, if they, if that is there, if they read that and they think these things are genuine or from heaven, it boggles the mind. Our Lady fully accepted the will of God, and she accepted that the crucifixion would happen, and she didn't fight against it because she see that her son was giving himself to it freely, and she's never going to oppose Jesus. But God never positively willed the crucifixion, and neither did Mary. Rather, Jesus surrendered to it. God always knew it was going to come, and he permitted it. Um, and Our Lady never argues with God, so she didn't argue with that happening. But there's no way she was ever any active cause of it, neither through sin and nor in her emotions or her intellect or her will. No part of her soul or body was for that that happened. Although she also had a joy on Calvary because she knew it was for our salvation. So all the natural sorrow in her, the heartbreak, um, well, not, you know, her heart doesn't, well, it was pierced. It was pierced. She she had more sorrow there than anyone, uh, any other creature could have. But she, she had this joy in seeing her son's work accomplished, a spiritual joy in, in the highest part of the soul. Well, God bless you all. I, I will look up the other questions later and bring them up at the beginning of the next live stream if it's pertinent. And um, it's Leitare Sunday tomorrow, um, a, a beautiful day in Lent. A, a time to rejoice. So I, um, well, God bless you and happy Leitare Sunday.